Um, so, so far we're talking about low level stuff and really fast, packets flowing as fast as we can. And now we are going to flip the switch. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are going to uh, layer, layers above that and some heavy stuff as you will see. So this is a, a general idea of the talk. Uh, what and why is a CTP? What we have done on it for the past two years and what we plan to do next. So a quick recap on what is SCTP. It may not be a pr protocol that everybody is familiar with. Um, it was conceived to transfer the old SS7 signaling protocol over IP networks. So it's a protocol designed to transfer signals and not bulk payload like TCP originally was. Um, and when it was conceived, it had requirements that was too much for TCP and for UDP, and they decided to create a new protocol, SCTP. So it's like this giant thing on which the application creates a socket, like on the other ones. But on this socket, you have out of, out of the box, multi-homing, multiplexing, you have chunking, on your message, uh, SCTP will break it in, into chunks for you so they can fit in IP packets without relying on fragmentation. Um, yeah. And to give an idea on how complex its implementation is, these are the main structures <laughs> that we have on it. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to trigger a cache miss in there. <laughs> It's something that we are not really worried about because it will happen. <laughs> and this is another. Yeah. <laughs> this is another slide to give an idea on how the implementation looks like. Uh, it's not uh, streamed implementation like on TCP. You have an entry point and then you go on on functions and. Uh, as you hit point of decisions, you do it and you take action right on that spot. We have a state machine. So we get to a point on, on for example, we want to send a uh, SAC after we process this. Okay, so we schedule that on our state machine and we continue processing. And then when we return to the main loop of that SCTP do SM, Oh, we have to send an, a SAC. So we get back to that and we send it. So um, another big source of cache miss and that's why we really don't, don't worry about this low performance stuff. Um, to have an idea of the features between SCTP, TCP and UDP, and we probably should add another column to this table for quick. Uh, recent news, the next HTTP version will be based on quick. Um, yep. And then on performance, <laughs> on TCP, this is for a kernel 4.14 running on rel. Uh, for TCP on 10 gig, we can saturate the card and pretty easily, but on SCTP, uh, this line here is on 3.5 gigabits. And by here we are hitting one course and per a hundred percent, and we don't scale more than that. And we can't scale to more than one core because it's one socket. So that's what we get out of it. If you want to more, to have more throughput, you have to use more sockets, and it, that probably you have to build a special application for that. With hardware offload. Jesse asked, with hardware outload? Out offload? Yeah. Um, for hardware offload, that's a big problem for us because currently only a few cards support at least CRC32 offloading. And none of them supports like GSO offloading. So it, that's the only thing we, we have. And this card had CRC32 offloading. And if you turn that off, you have a big impact because CRC32 is way heavier than the checksum. So what we have done on Linux so far. Uh, this is the good old library that we have to support applications. Um, 
on the left, we have the main structure of the library, directories. On the right side, we have first block the test applications that we have, so we can just kick some tests in there and see, check it using multi streaming, multi homing, and connecting to multiple destinations under the same socket. Because on SCTP, we have something that we call one to many and one to one. You can have the two styles uh, on different sockets, but you can have one association on one socket, which we call TCP style, and you can have one socket with multiple associations inside it, which is UDP style. And each association is completely independent of the other ones, and you can connect to many other hosts using multi homing. Um, this library also contains unit tests, but to test the library itself. And then the helper functions that user space applications are supposed to use because SCTP has six calls like SCTP connect X two or three. It was versions defined on RFC. And to avoid adding tons of six calls to the, to the kernel, uh, it was decided to add them through socket option calls. And then this library masks it into helper functions. This is a project that was created for testing, uh, general, general wise. Um, testing SCTP gets pretty complicated because of multi homing. So we have to create uh, one, two, three, four paths to the other host. And sometimes we want to bring some path down or chain them to while the association is running. And writing a single test case from scratch gets very cumbersome. So on this block here, we have uh, the share script defining the topology for testing using IPsec and just a client server. On this block is a test case that is running just using NetNS and client, router, and server topology. And this library handles all of this work to create of all this environment for us and we, have, we can focus only on the test itself. On this one, it was changing MTU uh, while the association was running and flowing traffic. So we could test uh, the feedback from ICMP fragmentation needed and update MTU and continue from there. This is a node uh, conformance suite it tests if the implementation that you have is in accordance to the RFC. It tests all these features and provides a report similar to, to that one. So that's how we know that the implementation is in conformance to the RFCs. And then we have others. We have Syscaller, Codenomicon, which are first tests. This color everybody knows, right? And Codenomicon does fuzzing, but from network side. So it injects weird packets and hopefully we don't crash with it. Packet drill and scap it to generate packets and check the response from them. And probably we have more in there. This now is uh, watching that we did because of this one too many style that we have. We have one socket that may have like a thousand associations under it and previously the implementation was using just a hash of associations and using just the port numbers as the hash key. So when a packet came in, we hashed the ports, got a key, and we had to traverse this entire list of 1,000 entries to find to which association that packet was. And that was very time consuming. And we fixed that by switching to uh, our hash table and not hashing associations anymore, but transports. And on transports, now we can hash the port numbers and also the remote IP address. And then with this extra key, the hash got more distributed and with that, the, the list has got way shorter. 
Um, the question is why did we not use like the full four tuple for that, including the local IP address? Because then we would have to add all combinations from addresses from both sides to the hash. And SCTP doesn't negotiate, oh, this address will talk to that address and this other address will talk to that other address. Mm -hmm. That's decided on the fly according to the routes that both systems have. So to not have to add M versus N uh, combinations, we can use just the destination address, which is probably, which is the one that changes if you consider like the local one is mostly always the same. And then we traverse on the list of few entries to find the correct transport. And finding the transport, we already have the association just like that, just a pointer. And why not make the R hash table per endpoint and socket? That's, the both hash tables are global. And we cannot make that per endpoint and per socket because then we would have an R hash table you would have too many rush tables and you have to have another index systems to know which socket to, leave, to look into. Doesn't make sense. Uh, we did GSO for SCTP. Remember that SCTP is mainly used for signaling, so book transfers are not its strongest. But when you are on local host, you can take some benefit of it if you are having big messages. And without GSO, we have on the left side, and with GSO, we have on the right side. You can see the difference on having the packets, multiple packets going down the stack and having one big packet going. And when we consider that local system is also receiving this, we get this boost on receive path also. And it's virtually not practical to do GRO for SCTP because whenever a chunk ends, it means that the message is done and we shouldn't wait to deliver that to the application because that's additional latency that it's not wanted. And if you have a really large message that's being fragmented and you, have, you are receiving it and you notice that the chunk doesn't have the end bit set, you could delay it. But consider that the main use case is signaling and to have that happen uh, over the internet, it's uh, very low probability. We had support for SCTP diagnostics. Um, previously we had pretty not much information about the SCTP sockets on user space. You should you had to look into slash proc to have informations about which associations were up, which transports were up. And it was um, not the best way to have information, especially for a system administrator. So with SCP diagnostics now on using SS2, you can have this pretty nice view on this socket, for example, that is listening for a new requests and it has all these associations established under it. So. This is to have an idea, sorry you cannot read that, <laughs> <laughs> of how many fields that we are exporting through this API. It's really pretty much everything that we know on the Sockton kernel, it's being exported through that. Uh, other fixes that we, we did, uh, destination search address selection. Uh, as I mentioned, SCTP doesn't negotiate which address will talk to which other address. And when we are deciding that, okay, we are going to talk to address two of our peer, but we don't know which uh, search we are going to use. So it has a, a special routing that is done in there and we had to force, let's say, that we are using an address that actually belongs to the interface that the packet is going out. Uh, we did some receive window improvements and we have to do more in there. We're going to have an issue on 
handling messages of different sizes because we have one receive buffer and Linux wants to account for both payload and overhead on our buffer and we we have some serious uh, <laughs> issues in there because we don't have a, 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 an average message size to rely on that's depending on the application and when we get lots of small messages the overhead gets very considerable and then the advertised window that we do doesn't reflect the reality of the amount of buffer that we have left. Partial reliability fix, M2 handling refactor. Uh, we had several places in the stack doing M2 handling, uh, trying to calculate how much we can put into a packet, and that was converged into a more consolidated code. We had critical fixes on path and MTU that discovery. Um, like I was saying on that, that test case, when you have one too many sockets, one too many socket style, and you receive an SMTP fragmentation needed, we weren't uh, fixing that information on the correct association. So that was a pretty bad bug. Uh, we had support for CRC32 offloading on virtual interfaces, which helped a lot, communication inside the same host. Other big features that we add, uh, stream schedulers and user master interleaving, both are defined on that RFC 8260. Uh, add additional policies for partial reliable control, because on SATP you can say, for example, that uh, a given message shouldn't be retransmitted more than three times. If it reaches that, you just drop the message and, and move on. So for some protocol like VoIP, you don't want to keep retransmitting because it doesn't make sense anymore and you could set this to zero and it just wouldn't retransmit. Uh, stream reconfiguration, by when the association is established, both peers, they say, hey, I need uh, five streams for output and I can use up to eight inputs and the other one does something similar and they agree on handshake. But if during the association they wanted to add another stream, they would have to tear down that, stream, that association and start it from scratch. And with this new RFC, we can just add another stream to a running association without having to reboot it. And there's also uh, a feature in there that we can reset a given stream. So when it, that stream doesn't have any data queued anymore, we are able to reset it, its SSN field, and then that stream is considered that it was never used. It it's rebooted from scratch and you can start using it again. Some applications wanted to do that because it it's pretty much like when you close a connection and you open a new one and everything's from scratch. Sockets API extensions is a new set of uh, extensions that's, that the applications, user applications can use to make use of SATP more efficiently. We will see more details a bit. And full SE Linux support. No you can have SE Linux policies saying that uh, a given user cannot accept, cannot make the given user application cannot connect to a different port than the policy saying. So that's as powerful as that. Stream schedulers. Uh, uh, before SATP worked on the first come, first serve uh, base, so you have multiple streams, you are multiplexing it, but you, they are all the same, and if the application queued a ton of that data on stream zero and another one on stream one, that's how it's going to be sent. And with stream schedulers, now we, we can choose the, how these streams will be served. There, we couldn't have run robbing. Um, first come, first serve, which is the default and we have another priority also. So you can say that stream one has higher priority than stream zero, and by when you queue this other 
uh, message in there, even though we, you had already queued like 10 messages on stream zero, that one will be sent as soon as possible. But just this, you still have a problem because using the original data chunk format, SATP cannot send more than one fragmented message at the same time. So if one stream is using a fragmented message and a, a stream with, with a higher priority comes in, it has to wait that whole message get done and then you can send it. With the new data chunk format, iData, uh, it allows message interleaving. So this other stream can preempt the other one and send its message before the other one completed. And as you can maybe see, uh, we have more indirect calls in the code and Spectre, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> The additional partial reliability policies that we have. Uh, time to leave, so you tell the stack that for a given uh, association that those messages should expire after 100 milliseconds. And you queue one message, another message, another message as long as you want. But if something happens, that if there's some congestion, packet drops or whatever, if the message doesn't get delivered between before 100 milliseconds, that message gets dropped and the, the next one, if not expired also, it will get sent. And SATP handles this expiring for you. The application doesn't have to do anything else, just inform, well, expired and move on. And that's pretty handy because then the application doesn't have to do that by itself, like controlling how much of a send buffer you are queuing. Limited retransmissions policy, I described it just ago. And priority, so priority um, it is not related to the stream schedules. Uh, they work on a different way, but you can have uh, another stream which are a higher priority of, of another one. And if you have a full buffer, and you are trying to queue something on this higher priority stream, it will drop the message on the lower priority one. So it's a way to make more intelligent use of the buffer. For stream reconfiguration, yeah, just also describe it. Uh, you can add outgoing streams, add incoming streams, uh, reset both streams and and with that, you do, the applications can have the association lasting longer. For socket APIs, um, for user API, we add SATP send V and SATP receive V functions. These are implemented on LK SATP tools library. Uh, send info flags, the send all it's meant to send this message to all associations under the same socket. So you don't have to repeat this is called to send the same message to all associations. Message more, you know already, uh, it's when you're telling the stack, hey, I have more data to send, don't, don't flush it yet. And additional control messages that we have, like instead of setting on the socket, the partial reliability information, you can set that per message when you are sending it. Same applies to authentication and to the destination messages. The comparison between Linux and BSD, the BSD stack is maintained by RCTP RFC authors, so it's quite updated. <laughs> and ours, yeah, we are catching up. You know, chunk formats, we support pretty much everything that is interesting. We don't have the non-renegable selective ACK, which is part of the CMT implementation. We don't have packet drop and pad chunk. And on the right side we have, uh, it's not really 
bad and good features. It's just to mention that one stack works this way and the other works on that way. We do have that state machine, they don't. And they have what we want to have, is like what we have for TCP today for congestion control. You have one defined uh, API that you can implement several congestion control algorithms and the user can choose which one is best in that case. SCTP on our implementation today, it's the only one and that's all you have. So what's next? Uh, we want to add support for those chunks, APIs, socket options and notifications as they come by, as they are defined on new drafts and RFCs. We are experimenting with NAT, SCTP NAT and CMT. NAT for SCTP is very complicated because you have IP addresses inside the header and you have the V tag which is also which also needs translating and you need cooperation from the firewalls in the middle of the network to make that happen. We are doing performance improvements including send buffer auto tuning. We, this is in the oven, it should be going out like in two or three weeks. We want to add more and more test cases to SATP tests because we really need it. Uh, we have 24, 27 tests yet and we, we need more. Like I was talking with Dave this week, we don't have a test for partial delivery. Partial delivery is when the application asks the stack to send a message to it, even though it didn't receive the message entirely yet. If the message was fragmented and it has four fragments, so it, it's done complete, and this, the application can ask, no, if it's more than one fragment, please send me already and I'll do something with it. And this feature, for example, in that, in that suite, it doesn't have any tests on it. We need to do some code refactor because we have some huge and massive functions. We had functions that they were pretty, pretty long. And it was hard to keep track of everything that was happening in there. We need to rework the congestion control to make this API. And maybe, maybe, maybe uh, integrate some part of it with the TCP stack because they, they work quite similarly and refactor LK SCTP tools to be more, to be more uh, specific. Like uh, we have test applications in it and we have the library that applications should rely on and at least those should actually be in different projects. Hardware support, it's the first one is a big discussion. Uh, GSO for SCTP was implemented using frag list and that's pretty hard to offload to actual cards. But that's how we found that we can overcome limitations that we would have using frags. Using frags, we, we are very limited to how much we can store on it while maintaining packet boundaries. And we couldn't get another way out of it yet. Checksum of loading. Um, it's unfortunate to see that only, I think only four, four, yeah, four cards support CRC 32 of loading. And without that, we can do any other of loading. So, yeah. That was it. Thanks for listening. I'm curious if you've thought about uh, integrating the tests into the self-test area of the kernel at some point. No, we didn't think. Okay, because I, I mean, if you see it a lot, the, the trend is that we can set up any network hierarchy with namespaces or whatever, and we, so we can replicate whatever you're trying to do with setting up multi-homing situations and whatever, and for someone who wants to make a, a tree-wide change like I am recently, it's kind of, it's difficult to touch the SCTP code and know that you've not broken anything. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think if at some point you do the work to move the tests into the self-test, two things will happen. People will be more confident to contribute to SCTP, and secondarily, all the robots will be automatically testing SCTP every single day. So that is something to consider, I think. Okay, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Any questions? This was interesting. It's kind of a deja vu. I remember at in Ottawa 10 or 15 years ago an SCTP presentation and sitting in the hallway prototyping as an app, in this case, you know, a Mount to Samba using SCTP. So one of the things I was curious is, okay, you've got network people here, but what if you're an app, you want to do FTP? But what would it look like? And we know it goes over socket, or maybe an easier example might be like SMB client or some user space tool to Samba. What does it look like? Different than a socket. You call a socket today, you open it, okay, what do you have to pass in that's different? The address looks different. So like where would I look? Let's say you wanted to enable some simple tool like Samba's FTP-like tool, SMB client. Mm -hmm. What would be different in the address that you'd specify? What would be different, in, you know, you got an IO vec you're going to pass to a socket right. What, is, what looks different? Um, or can you just use the socket API and just specify a little bit for the first pass? Obviously, these other features are cool, but to proof of concept, what looks different on creating the socket and doing your vectored right? That would depend on how much of SCTP you want to use. You, on that LK SCTP tools package, we have a library that you can LD preload on, with, on your application. Oh, and minimal first. Absolute minimal first. But I think what he's trying to tell you is that they have a yeah. facility to get the TCP-like situation, right? Is that where you're going with this? Yes, yes. Then with this uh, library, you can test the application with SCTP without having any single change on the application for applications that are TCP style. And so that would mean the socket call to create the socket is the, virtually the same, the connect call is the same, the receive, the send functions are the same, the teardown is the same, can be mapped into one another. But if you want to use more advanced functions from SCTP, like getting notifications that uh, transport uh, communication path between two addresses went down, then you cannot use that. You need to hook more deeply in the stack. So, sorry. You know, there are some guys here, I, I don't have long these here, there's some guys uh, that work on RDMA. So when they played with RDMA, what they did was they said, oh, we'll add an a mount option for RDMA. So if you wanted, instead of a socket, to mount over SMB with RDMA, you just say RDMA. So that's the simple sort of first step we're thinking about. We mount SCTP. So it sounds like for the first phase, all you'd have to do is you know take NFS or SMB or some user space tools, take some kernel driver, and just you got a socket underneath you. So the only thing you'd pass in is one new mount farm to force it to use SCTP for that address instead of TCP for that address. Is it really that simple? We just open a socket with a slightly different thing and we're done for the first phase. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, one SCTP user in the kernel today, which is the DLM, Distributed Lock Manager, and they share most of the code. Okay. Thank you, Marcel. Yep. Thank you.